months ago. I had a dream, so I have to tell my dream. Do you have a second? <laughs> do you mind if I tell my dream? Let's do it. So the reason why we're here today is that I had a dream in the spring that I went to a conference and I brought all of my Bruce Lipton books to the conference. And after the conference, I went to a, bu uh, a back room and the man himself, Bruce Lipton, was there and I brought all my books and he signed them. And before we know it, we're chatting and laughing. And in my dream, the thought that crosses my mind was, cool, I'm best friends with Bruce Lipton. <laughs> and I woke up chuckling that I'm, you know, I'm best friends with Bruce Lipton. And I thought that was very humorous. And then, wouldn't you know it, a few days later, I got the um, catalog from Kripalu Magazine, from the Kripalu Center, that Bruce was going to be there. And I just knew that it meant I was supposed to be there. My husband said, great, I have a fishing trip. And so he was confirmation. So he thanks you, Bruce, for, uh, for his fishing trip. So, Thank you so very much for your dream. <laughs> yes, and I went. I went to Kripalu. I met Bruce. He signed my books, and I said, we're best friends now, and you need to be on my show, and so we're here. So thank you so much. Thank you. So, Bruce, um, I am marveled that there are some people uh, in my world who don't know who you are, so I need to introduce you formally. I think it's um, preposterous that people don't know who you are, but that's me. So I want to tell people a little bit about you. And, and why we're talking about what we're talking about today. And what we're talking about today is what if we are here to create heaven on earth? What if each and every one of us is here to create heaven on earth in our bodies, in our relationships, in our environment, our politics, our economy? Is this even possible? And Bruce tells us there's science that says yes. So let me tell you about Bruce. Bruce Lipton, Ph.D., is a stem cell biologist and best-selling author of The Biology of Belief, Spontaneous Evolution, and The uh, Honeymoon Effect. <laughs> and uh, he served as associate professor of anatomy in the School of Medicine at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, from 1973 to 1982. In the medical curriculum, Bruce lectured in cell biology, histology, and embryology, his pioneering research on cloned human stem cells presaged today's revolutionary field of epigenetics. So you're a hero to all of us. Um, Dr. Lipton later served as a research fellow in the Department of Pathology in Stanford University School of Medicine from 1987 to 92. And groundbreaking research at Stanford revealed the nature of the biochemical pathways by which the mind, in other words, perceptions and beliefs, controls human behavior and genetic activity. In addition to being listed in the top 100 of the world's most spiritually influential living people by the United Kingdom's Watkins Journal, Bruce received in 2009 the prestigious Goei Peace Award in Japan in honor of his scientific contribution to world harmony. Bruce has lectured in seven of the eight continents and is still awaiting an invitation from the penguins to present in Antarctica. Bruce, welcome to Thrive with Morella. Well, Morella, I am so happy to be here with you and also to be here with your audience because this is an amazing time in planetary evolution. And when we look outside the window and see all the chaos and craziness between politics and racism and religion and all that, uh, it's kind of daunting. You know, you look and go, oh my God, the world's falling apart. And, and so now let's stop for one second and say, Thank God the world is falling apart because the way humans have been living on the planet, uh, we have created what is called the sixth mass extinction of mm -hmm. life on the planet. We've so undermined uh, the nature of the ecological web uh, that we're destroying the web of life. And unfortunately, people don't recognize we are the web of life. So when uh, we destroy the environment, we are destroying ourselves. And so we're in a transition. Yeah. And the transition is moving from a non-sustainable world, the one we're in, into a sustainable world. Well, when that happens, you have to take the structure of the old one, break it down, but simultaneously build up the new one. So there's mm -hmm. this, between the old and the new, there's a zone called chaos, right. where everything looks like it's crazy, but it's actually on a plan. And the idea is we must disassemble the old in order to create uh, a world that we can thrive into. Right. And this is the wake up call. So uh, a matter of fact, 
if nothing changed and it was all exactly the same, we'd be in a worse situation you ever want to know about because the extinction is looming not in a thousand years, within a century and right. within a couple of decades, this whole thing is upside down. So. Uh, welcome to evolution. <laughs> welcome to evolution. And, you know, I, I poured through um, spontaneous evolution over the weekend just to kind of get really into your subject. And what I loved is even though you're talking about we are in a very real way looking at this mass extinction that we're contributing to. And then you also share that in, in uh, uh, anthropology, paleontology, you know, these mass extinctions are what precipitates evolution that our, our our quantum leaps in evolution is or that evolution happens in quantum leaps right yes it's not the gradual slow thing that we saw in a darwinian evolution uh it's actually catastrophic upheaval and then a rebuilding right uh, and so we are seeing a catastrophic upheaval but hopefully we don't have to rebuild all of nature maybe we could just rebuild our culture right. and then all of nature will come back so I really want to get into that, rebuilding our culture. And before we, we dive into it, um, you, you really started us off precisely where I was coming into this interview with the thought, you know, just a week ago, we got a climate report, right, from the administration saying, oh, my God, things are worse than we even imagined than we knew they were right so it is feeling really chaotic the the environment is feeling chaotic poli the politics are feeling chaotic everywhere in the world the economy you know some say it's it's getting better but we're feeling like you know it's on a very very feeble um, stand so everything Bruce everything is feeling so chaotic so how are we going to take this leap? How are we creating heaven on earth out of this chaos? Well, the most important understanding here to help us get into the future is a classic old phrase that people know, and it's called knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. And while everyone says, yeah, knowledge is power, I want to emphasize the, the corollary, and that is a lack of knowledge is a lack of power. And why is this relevant? Because when it comes to who we are, how we work biological, biologically, uh, our evolution and consciousness and all this, we have such an amazing lack of information mm -hmm. and actually been given information that we bought into like genes control life, which is totally right. false. Uh, there's a number, actually there are four false assumptions. Uh, and if I just list yes. them really quickly. Please number tell one, us, yep. Uh, the, the belief that uh, genes control life this is totally false. Yeah. Uh, and it's disempowering. Uh, and the reason why it's disempowering is as far as we know, we didn't pick the genes we came with. And if we don't like the characteristics, we can't change the genes. And right. we bought into the belief that genes turn on and off leaves us as a victim of our heredity. Like, oh, there's cancer running in my family and I've got the cancer gene, although there is no cancer gene. <laughs> uh, the belief in that has disempowered us because it says I'm a victim. I right. can't control my genes and therefore they control me. That's assumption number one, it's totally false, okay? Yeah. Uh, assumption number two is that we perceive of the world in dualities, the realm of matter and energy. Uh, and this is a Newtonian belief that they're separate realms and they mm -hmm. don't really communicate with each other, which then all of a sudden makes a question of how can mind and energy influence body matter when it doesn't conform to Newtonian? Well, then the whole idea is this, the Newtonian belief is not a correct assumption of how the universe works. Quantum physics mm -hmm. is, the, is the most valid science on this planet. I want to emphasize that again because I'm going to make a statement about yeah. what we're going to talk about. Yeah. Quantum physics, there is no science with more truth than quantum physics on this planet. It's been the most tested and revered of all sciences. And I say, so why am I emphasizing that? Because then here's I'm going to make up the number one premise <laughs> in quantum physics is that consciousness is creating our life experiences. And I say, well, why is that relevant? I say, well, that's the truth. And if that's the truth, then what does it say? It says, if I change my consciousness, I change my life experiences. Yeah. I go, that's what we're going to work on because our consciousness has made us uh, victims of limitations and belief. Uh, the, the, the other two assumptions that yep. are incorrect 
uh, are Darwinian in nature. Number one is that uh, the belief that life is a struggle for existence, you know, trying to, you know, struggle and survive with competition and all that is the drive force of evolution. Turns out this is completely false. That competition plays a role, but the main drive thrust of evolution is cooperation. <laughs> completely opposite. Cooperation, I mean, just simply say, we talk about a garden of Eden. I go, yeah, a garden. You know what a garden is? A garden is the height of cooperation. All the organisms in a garden make it work, okay? And, and we walk into the garden and saying competition, and then we start competing, right. and, uh, and we have gotten so far out of the nature of what life is all about that our competition has led to the destruction of the environment that we're facing right now, yeah. okay? Yeah. So the idea of why is competition a problem? Competition leads to violence, violence mm -hmm. leads to war, and then we justify war based on a competition between elements, right. okay? Totally wrong. Totally Cooperation. Wrong. Yeah. And the last one, uh, Darwinian again, because Darwinian theory has two steps to make evolution. The first is called a random mutation, which is a change in the genetics. And then the second step is called natural selection. Nature will select. Uh, if the mutation is a beneficial one, then that will be selected to be passed on. And if the mutation is deleterious, negative, that mutation will disappear. So I say, well, then why are we here? Step one in evolution is random mutation. I go, but that's accidental. So then I say, well, then why are we here? And you go, well, a whole bunch of accidental mm -hmm. genetic mutations. So I say, what's the purpose in that? And all of a sudden you realize it's like, it's an accident. There's it's an no accident. Purpose. <laughs> and then that leads us to believe that we're just visitors on this place, that we can do whatever the heck we right. want. When it turns out, again, completely false, that every organism introduced into the environment by nature was introduced to bring harmony and balance. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the higher up the scale you are, the more powerful you are in bringing harmony and balance. I say, well, then where are we? Well, we're right near the top. I say, why is it relevant? Because if we're that powerful to change the balance, it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to bring it back into harmony. We could use the same power and take the whole damn thing out of harmony. Right, which and, we seem to be doing very well. <laughs> Well, congratulations to humans. Look what we've done. We destroy the environment. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so when those assumptions are, are, are taken as valued truth, which we have for mm -hmm. them, uh, they are completely disempowering. They give us no purpose on this planet. Uh, and they, they really just give us the nature. We're victims of everything around the world. And right. this is so false. So I go back and I say, well, what was quantum physics first principle? Mm -hmm. And again, most valid science, consciousness is creating this and all of a sudden it says you have to let go of these old beliefs that put like a box around our head and keep us from thinking big right. because right. the reality is we are creating life and we're creating it and it's interesting I use in my lectures a quote from uh, uh, the journal Nature most prestigious scientific journal yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's a uh, it's a paper by a physicist from Johns Hopkins uh, Richard Con Henry, the paper is entitled The Mental Universe. I'll just, uh, the last sentence is what I just want to repeat. The last sentence in this scientific article. The universe is immaterial. It's mental and spiritual. Live and enjoy. My God, that's coming from quantum physicists, you know, in the journal Nature, the most prestigious scientific journal. So what's the point? It's like, wake up. Mm -hmm. We are creating this. And if we understand it, then we can start to change the creation from the destruction right. into rebuilding this planet in such a way that we can thrive into the future. And it's you, your generation, Morella, the younger people. This is where the evolution is going to come from. It's not coming from the older people. They're stuck in concrete ideas of old belief systems. And so like this last election is a, a movement. Jeez, I wish it was bigger, but mm -hmm. it's a movement toward mm -hmm. what? Younger people taking responsibility by voting yeah. and putting themselves into office where policy is made. And so the more younger and the more diverse women, minorities, the more uh, of a spectrum right. that we can put into, into government, the more power we're going to see this evolution process going on right now. So uh, we are in an evolution and we're at the edge saying, boy, this thing is going down the tubes. Wake up. Let's move. Right. And that's where we are. 
And so there's so many, so many things that you've said that I, we could kind of dive in so much more deeply. But one of the things, you know, I was telling one of my dear friends about interviewing you and all the reasons why I was exciting, excited uh, about our conversation. And her question was a really great one because she said, how is it that he and scientists like you are looking at quantum quantum mechanics and epigenetics and the science of the last century and change and that has radically proven how all of these four precepts that you've mentioned are false and she says why is it that other scientists are looking at you know at the old science why why are other scientists not arriving at the same conclusions that bruce lipton is arriving at and so well they are it's just taken a long time because you're trying to unseat a structure that has been built for years and years of layers upon layers. And I say, well, one of the things that's important is how much money did you invest in this structure? Right. Oh, they well, always spent hundreds of billion dollars. And then you say, well, what, maybe that was wrong. And they go, hundreds of billions of dollars. We can't be wrong, <laughs> you know? Right. And, and, and the idea is this, it is four, okay, let, let's <laughs> backtrack one important step. Many people out there in this audience have seen the movie The Matrix. Yeah. And what's really important about it is that the movie The Matrix is not science fiction. It's actually a documentary uh, because everyone has been programmed. That is a natural state of human development. The first seven years of life is programming. It's mechanistic. It's neurological, blah, blah, blah. It's done. What's the point? And the point is this, is that uh, as in the movie... Uh, matrix there's a point where you could take the blue pill and then you're just in the same world of programming just as we've seen it every day nothing different and then they say you take the red pill and you get out of the program uh, and then it doesn't really emphasize so what happens when when you're really out of the program uh, and, and and so I, I you know to lead into our wonderful conversation uh, what's really interesting is most people have taken the red pill and have altered the programming that has shaped their lives up until that moment yeah. And most of that programming, 70%, is negative and disempowering programs of limitation. It's not. So I say, so what happened? When was that red pill taken? Well, for m most people that have experienced it, it is when they fell deeply in love with somebody. And when they fell deeply in love, mm. their lives changed in 24 hours. They could have blah, 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 blah. And then they meet somebody and 24 hours later, it's like, oh. Oh, it's heaven on earth. Life is so beautiful. Love is great. The food's great. The music's great. Even the job that stinks is not so bad. Right. Everything got better. I go, in 24 hours, the, your whole life changed from blah, blah, blah into heaven on earth. And, and now we know why scientifically is because it's been demonstrated that when we fall in love like that, we stop playing the programs. And the moment we start playing, stop playing the programs is when we become creators <laughs> if you're playing a program you're just taking the old play and redoing it day by day by day but the moment you stop playing the program the next movement is creative right. and that's where our conscious mind kicks in i say and what happens when you stop playing the program well that's when people start to experience heaven on earth i go hey, precisely <laughs> mm -hmm. it was available all of the time right except the fact that you've been unconsciously playing a program of limitation and victimization and and this was foisted upon us. it's not an accident people the fact that we have been programmed and that the program runs our life right think right. about it 400 years 400 years the jesuits have told their community give me a child until it is seven and i will show you the man they told people for 400 years if i get the first seven years of programming in the rest of your life is based on that programming. Right. It's true. And it's been true for 400 years. Uh, interesting part about it is that little fact <laughs> never got lost from the leadership of this world. Why? Right. It's the foundation of controlling the world. And we have been all programmed to lose power through information that is not supporting us, that is actually information that is supported by corporations such as the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. Because if you really understand who you are, you don't need drugs. You make all your drugs in your mind. <laughs> uh, why do you need to take them? And the point is, yeah, but when you start dealing with an industry worth trillions of dollars, are they going to say, oh, yeah, okay, guys, yes, you're very powerful. We're not going to make any more drugs because you can do it. Right. Of course not. 
<laughs> yeah, nobody this makes money if we, it, yeah, nobody makes money if we all learn how to spontaneously heal. You know, and uh, it's interesting, just because you bring, it just came in my head, a thought about it, and it was very simply this, is when the Catholic Church was having its problems, re Reformation and all that kind of stuff, uh, Mary Magdalene apparently went to uh, France and became was Black Madonna, uh, mm -hmm. formed, a, you know, part of an organization called Gnostics. Okay. Gnostics were what? People that had direct knowledge of understanding who they are, creation and all that. And I say, what's the relevance? Well, they didn't need the church. Right. And in fact, uh, they, they said, you know, the church is not even there. Right. And there were millions of Gnostics. Right. But the challenge to the church was so great. Guess what? There was a Holocaust of Gnostics. They killed millions of them. Why? They were stepping outside of the control. Right. And yes. Yeah, and what you're alluding to um, is you're, you're talking about how the the sub, you know the programming that we've received generation upon generation upon century upon century of limitation of you know programs of our powerlessness of how we're helpless about first and first it was the church and uh, I find really interesting that you make a parallel in in your books and especially in in spontaneous evolution about how. Our culture, our, our current reverence of science, and I say science with, you know, quotation marks, you know, like the old science has taken on kind of a, a, a church-like status <laughs> where if you, if you are, you know, a heretic to challenge some of the scientific, yes. scientific truths, you know, you're prosecuted and, you know, back then the religious persecution would call you a heretic. The scientific persecution m would call you a quack or, you know, a, a heretic of, of science. And so I, I'm, I'm fascinated that you draw these, these parallels and all of that, what I hear you say is that it's the compounding of limiting beliefs that have been handed generation after generation after generation and they just keep us asleep. Uh, absolutely. This is the mission statement of any institution that's in charge is to keep the institution running. And how do you keep it running? Well, you have to keep everybody in there. Uh, uh, and it starts with fear. Right. Uh, fear of what? The first thing, uh, fear of death. That's where religion stepped in and said, hey, don't worry. We have the answer. <laughs> I got and you. Give us some money. Uh, we will help you get to where you want to go. They created the destination and the charges to get to the destination and create a whole bunch of rules around something they made up mm -hmm. and we bought into it, okay? Uh, and then science comes in and guess what? Still operates from the fear. The fear of what? You have no control over your health. You are a victim of your genetics. You're a victim of germs, bacteria, viruses, parasites. You're victim, victim, victim. And then all of a sudden they say, but we are here to help you. <laughs> and therefore, they offer the, the, the church sacraments in, in the sense of pharmaceuticals. Right. Oh, yeah, look, uh, here are statins. You can take the statins. It's like, my God, what a fake story that is. You know why? Only 3% of the population that takes statins for life yeah. has any benefit. I go, wow, that means 97% of the customers of statins have no positive benefit. And then I turn around and go, and the side effects, which are toxic, affect 23%. Yeah. My God, 3% uh, get help, 23% just got sicker yeah. from taking this drug. But we buy it because we have been told the story that science knows and who the hell are we? We are just nobodies and we have to right. buy the story. Uh, and the simple reality is this, this is a corporate structure. Right. This right. is, and, and I'm going to give a fact, and I'm, I'm not making this up. This is right out of the Journal of the American Medical Association, right, their own journal, that they claim, <laughs> not wanting to, that they are the third leading cause of death in the United States. Now, when doctors claim that they are the third leading cause of death, somebody should stop and go, the health industry is the third leading <laughs> cause of death. You know, you know, it's like, well, but it's mm -hmm. business as usual, business as usual. It's like, yeah. my God. I know. And, you know, some, some things are clicking together in my brain as I'm hearing you speak because you draw a, an incredible parallel between our Western medical 
practices and our approach to defense or war. And it's, you know, keep people afraid, feeling powerless, and attacking the symptom. And so I'm reading your book and looking, you know, thinking these things and hearing you talk about this now. And, you know, it's the third cause of death. Our treatment is the third cause of death because we're attacking symptoms. We're giving people pills to, you know, kill the symptom. And then there are all of these side effects or casualties of the war. And in both cases, we're not really looking at the cause. And I, I loved hearing that parallel, reading that parallel in your books where neither in our approach to defense in the outside world nor our approach of like this defense against um, the diseases of the body, the, the, the frailties of the body, are we looking at the cause? <laughs> no, well, all we're looking at are symptoms. Uh, and people say, oh, cancer, that's the biggest disease cause problem. I go, cancer is a symptom of a system not in harmony. People always blame it on the genes. Oh, there's cancer genes, you know, oh, BRCA1 gene, breast cancer gene, uh, you know, Angelina Jolie gets a double mastectomy and the rest of the women around the world are, oh my God, she did that. I need to do that as well. Right. Why? What was the belief? Let's start with the belief. The gene causes cancer. Right. And then I say, now squash the belief for this reason. 50% of the women that have the gene never get the cancer. I said, well, what's the relevance? I go, having the gene didn't cause the cancer. It was a lifestyle that activates the gene that caused the cancer. So you say, well, I'm going to kill all the cancer cells. I say, great, but that wasn't, that's a symptom of a life out of order. Right. I say, well, you can get rid of the cancer, but if you didn't change the life out of order, it's going to come back again because that was not the problem. Yeah. Uh, we have to recognize this. And, and just to jump in so people don't, you know, it's like what Lipton talking about. Well, first of all, <laughs> let's recognize this. From one third to two thirds, minimum one third to two thirds of all medical healings are due to what is called the placebo effect. Mm -hmm. And the placebo effect is simply defined as this a belief in the efficacy of a pill or a surgery and healing, you believe it. Mm -hmm. And then you take the pill, which is a sugar pill, and you don't know it, but you get better, or you get the same surgery, which was a sham, but you still get better. And the point was, well, what healed you? And the answer was, it was the belief in the healing, not the pill, not the surgery. Mm -hmm. And everybody goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Placebo effect, a very positive thought about an outcome. And I go, and what about a negative thought? And everybody goes, what? Well, <laughs> say, what about a negative thought? Uh, and the reason why I bring it up is because no one ever talks about it. And I'm going to tell you why it's important. Thought is what controls biology, our life, our experiences, even quantum physics. Consciousness is creating it. Yeah. And I go, well, absolutely true. And I say, well, positive thoughts lead to something called the placebo effect. You can heal yourself with a sugar pill. And I say, yeah. Well, what about negative thoughts? And they go, ah, <laughs> that's what we don't talk about. Why? It's equally powerful in controlling our lives, but it works in the opposite direction. Yeah. A negative thought can cause any disease on this planet. All you have to do is have enough conviction in that thought, and you can manifest cancer. You could die because you believe you're going to die. And all of a sudden, it's like, my God, negative thought is so profoundly important, and no one talks about it. Yeah. And I'm saying, yeah, but 70% or more of our thoughts are negative in the first place. And all of a sudden I say, then the major thoughts are not enhancing life. The major thoughts are precipitating all the problems. Right. And we never talk about what is called the nocebo effect. Right. Yeah. And at the risk, of course, of sounding cynical, is you, you can't package, you know, this idea of avoiding negative thoughts into a pill that you can sell or patent. So, well... We don't talk this, about this, it. Yeah, I mean, there, there's money in this. Uh, and that's why the advertisements are always like, oh, flu season is coming. You better get your flu shot. And it's like, uh, you know, I always have a little problem with that because basically, when did you create this antibody in your flu shot? Well, we did it last year. And I said, was the flu here? No, not yet. I said, well, how the heck do you know this is the vaccine? It's like, right. consciousness. I got a flu shot. I'm okay. Right. Guess what? You don't need the darn flu shot. All you have to do is have the thought, I am not going to get the flu. Right. I'm too busy. I have work to do. I don't have time. And guess what? You could walk through all the wards of sick people in all the hospitals and walk out the other end and never have a problem. 
Exactly. Exactly. So since we're talking squarely in the realm of health, and there are a couple other areas that I want to ask you about, but there, I offered for people to send me their questions, and there are lots of questions related to health. And so you're talking about how thought creates biology. You've mentioned how our genes are not our fate, um, you know, the placebo effect, the nocebo effect. So, you know, questions like, does belief trump food so you know there's so much that we hear about you know we need to eat this and this superfood and that superfood and this supplement and we need that and we need the you know probiotics and everything i read about you and my own belief i'm like you know what belief probably trumps food so what's your thought does belief trump food 100 percent in fact food is not even really necessary for a human everyone thinks we get all our energy from metabolism but it turns out uh, perhaps the majority of the energy we get is actually taking it out of the environment like plants take sunlight and use that sunlight energy to manifest organic compounds food and humans take electromagnetic energy fields and convert it into biological energy and so the fact is that we are downloading energy do we need to eat food? You know what? Sci this is a fact of science that nobody wants to talk about. And the <laughs> fact is, we should live to a minimum of 150 years of age. And one of the reasons why we die early is we eat too much food. Mm -hmm. And you go, what do you mean? I go, when you burn a fuel to make energy, there's always byproduct, waste product. So when you look at the exhaust pipe of the car uh, and you see what's coming out of there, it's toxic as heck. It's a burn <laughs> product. And I go, metabolism is burning food there's byproducts of metabolism just like the exhaust pipe in the car it's called right. free radicals and free radicals which are arrived from digestion attack our cells and kill our cells especially in the nervous system and so what we're finding and this is true in a laboratory test that like when you grow rats in a lab uh, you, you don't have somebody give them lunch and breakfast and dinner and shows up and here's a little pellet and all that <laughs> You, you put like a month's worth of food in the basket thing and they can eat anytime they want. And then, so they looked at the lifespan where there was abundant food. They could eat whatever the heck they want and compared it to uh, rats that were fed a minimalistic diet, just a small amount, just a small amount. The rats on the minimum diet lived twice as long yeah. as yeah. the rats that were eating the food at abundance. And it turns out it's not just rats, it turns out to be monkeys, and it turns out to be other animals. And the evidence right now also points to humans, that we are eating way too much food. And yet, food is delightful when it's done for, <laughs> for delight. But if it's done because you eat because it's 12 o'clock, the bell rang, it's time to put food in your mouth, Pavlov, yeah. it's lunchtime, and you're not even paying attention to the food because you're so caught up in your life, your work and everything, and you just ate all that. Right. I say, did you enjoy it? Mm -hmm. No, I don't remember. I just pushed it down. It was lunchtime. I go, you lost the reason for eating food. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Yes, the the enjoying it pleasure as the main reason for eating food. Well, that could be the main reason why we're here in the first place. Mm, say more about that. Pleasure? Well, yeah, the, the pleasure of what? I, I, okay. Yeah, you know, um, years ago, uh um uh, I had to ask myself as a scientist because I started to get into information about how the cell's identity uh, is connected to a set of antennas, proteins on the surface of the cell, mm -hmm. like nano antennas, like television antennas. No two people have the same set of these antennas, which are called self receptors, okay. which is an interesting right. term because they distinguish one cell from another cell. No two right. people have the same combination. And, and what's interesting about self receptors is that well, the proteins represent the difference between us because I can look at your cells and my cells, and this is why we can't exchange parts. I put in my heart into your body, and guess what? Your immune system says not self. It's going to destroy it. And I say, how does it know it's not self? The antennas. Those antennas. Okay. And the antennas, so we say, well, that's where the self is. And I go, no, no. They're antennas. <laughs> <laughs> They're antennas. There's a signal, a signal that's coming to the antennas. And I say, why is it relevant? Because the signal of self is from the environment mm -hmm. picked up by these antennas. So no, no two people are recording the same self, okay? And there's a broadcast. It's an energy. I go, the first moment that I realized this, I said, well, how can I die? I'm not in here. Right. I'm a broadcast. So it's like liking it to a television set. 
Yeah. Now yeah. we're watching the Bruce show. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, and I say, and if the television breaks, we say the television's dead. And I go, absolutely true. And if so, if all of a sudden I break and I'm dead, the same question applies. The television died, but is the broadcast still there? And of course right. the broadcast is still there <laughs> because it's not the body, it's the energy. And yeah. if a future embryo shows up with the same set of antennas, then you're back online, but in a different TV set. Right. Does it have to be male or female? No, that's TV set. Does it have to be white, black, brown, yellow, red? No, that's a TV set. <laughs> we have to distinguish between the TV and the broadcast, right. okay? And, and so once I started to recognize that, I asked a very pertinent personal question to myself who was not a spiritual person. I was into genes and proteins like every scientist. Yeah. But when yeah. I started to recognize that, oh my God, my identity is this broadcast. Mm -hmm. And it's here whether I'm here or not. <laughs> uh, I asked a question that why have a spirit and yeah. a body? Why not just be a spirit? And that's the, the part that I always remember because I asked that question pondering scientifically, <laughs> why have both? And the answer welled up from 50 trillion cells inside my body came mm. up to my head. And the answer, because they're funny cells, uh, the, I asked, why have a spirit and a body? And the cells responded with a question asking me, Bruce, if you're just a spirit, what does chocolate taste like? Yeah. And all of a sudden I said, oh my God. The senses that we experience, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, touch, pain, temperature, love, all those experiences, they're created by the cells of the body. Right. And the nervous system is creating this and then broadcasting that back into the universe again. Right. And I go, so right. why was it relevant? The body is an extension of the spirit. With it, uh, you can taste what the chocolate tastes like. You can see what the sunset looks like. You can feel what love feels like. So having a body is an extension to the spirit. It's a virtual reality suit. Yeah. I say, so why am I here? To have experiences. Well, do I want to have negative ones? I go, personally, nope, I don't want to have negative ones. If I'm going to create experiences and I want to create happiness and love and joy and health and, and to wake up every day and go, oh, my God, I'm still here playing on this planet. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and that is the reason that I see for us being here. I do not see us as a spirit coming in and say, boy, I can't wait to get some pain today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got to get and, me and some see, pills. So, so the reality is we are creators. Hey, that's biology, that's epigenetics, that's mm -hmm. quantum physics, that's all coming together. That's a fact of science. Yeah. And the fact is if we are creators, then how come, how come the world out there is so crazy? Right. How right. come there's war and violence and all this stuff? I go, who, who wants to create that? <laughs> and I go, we were programmed that this is the way life is. Right manipulated by the programmers okay yeah and the original programmers were the church because they were there they knowledge is power they said we have all of the knowledge infallible knowledge which right. means absolute right. knowledge which is absolute power and, and then when they lost that to charles darwin's new vision of evolution taking over instead of genesis the power <laughs> moved over to the science side. Right. Now right. you say, well, science is the problem. We go, and, and let me clear this up because I, I'm a, I was, a, you know, an engaged scientist and did research and loved every bit of it. Am I the guilty guy here? And I go, no, not the real scientist. It's the technology people right. that took the science and then tried to use it. Right. whether to advance civilization or to control civilization. Right. Uh, so it's not the scientists that created the problems. They just created an awareness. Right. It was right. the technology people that used the awareness to their benefit. Yeah. And then we yeah. blame it on science did this. Like, oh, science never did that. Science just said how it worked. Right. Somebody right. with a lot of money said, I want it to work for me this way. And all of a sudden they own the science. And now it's it's not science. It, it, it's it's technology using science yeah technology and it, you know t using using science there, there's like multiple things here because it's the 
you know, deif- deification of science and, you know, just the, the adoration of science uh, blindly, the same thing that would happen in religion, right? And it's also using science for control and, um, you know, using our, our systems for control of other people out of fear, right? So all of these things that, that you've mentioned. Um, and you also, I, I loved, you know, it feels pertinent at this point where you're mentioning this about, you know, the misuse of science and the use of science for control and, and for keeping people powerless, whether people are doing, doing it consciously and deliberately or not. But you, I loved that you essentially quote scripture in multiple parts of your book, which is essentially, you know, about science, but you quote scripture and you say, and you quote Jesus' words of, you know, forgive them because they don't know what they do. You know, that's not, but that, 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 and so what I take from that and from what you've been sharing is like, you know, all of these eons of programming, right? We're, we're kind of been, we've been programmed for warfare, for competition, for, mm-hmm. you know, to feel powerless, to feel defenseless, that we need to attack, right? Um, you know, that's kind of what is perpetuating all of this. And so if we see, if we, you know, if we kind of give them all the benefit of the doubt, then, you know, they, even the ones who are using it for control, they don't know what they're doing, right? Well, I think, unfortunately, those at the top know exactly what they're doing. Mm. Because I said, if the Jesuits have told them the answer for 400 years, how many years does it take to finally say, hey, what if they're right? (laughs) And all of a sudden, then what did you do? You created an awareness and education. You propagate this. You you take away uh, the power. And it's interesting because here's a simple to me fact of biology every human is equally powerful to every other human because it's all based on creativity and consciousness. And I go, well, if everybody's equally powerful, then how do some people like Bill Gates or somebody like that get all that power? Mm -hmm. And then the joke is they didn't get any more power. They took away our power. Mm -hmm. So they're operating at the full level of using the power. And we're operating at a, a, you know, at a limited level because we've been programmed not to have the power. So we started out at equal terms, then we lose the power, mm-hmm. but the guy at the top still is powerful. Right. Ha! So the idea is when do we get our power back? When we become educated mm-hmm. on the basis of what the new science is revealing and then own this. And this is what I mean when I say own this, because look, when we started, I said, Hey, quantum physics, a primary principle is consciousness is creating our life experience. Everybody goes, yeah, okay, let me take some notes of quantum physics. Then we finish talking and you go back into the world just like everything is the way it was. Like, oh, wait, Mm -hmm. you still didn't get it. (laughs) This is the principle of the entire universe that we're living in. Mm -hmm. And so when I say it that way, I say, yes, consciousness is creating our life experiences. It's not a flippant thing. That's the actual scientific truth. Yeah. And the idea is... But we've been so programmed with a different truth that when the new truth shows up, it becomes questionable. But this is the way every evolution in science has taken place. Every evolution in science was not, oh, let's welcome the new idea. Here it is. It's like every new idea that came in was was attacked by the existing system because it changes the belief. And that it took time for every belief that comes in to go through this before it can finally be accepted and then run on its own. So epigenetics, I saw it in 1967. I wrote about it for 20 years or so, 23 years before science even acknowledged that epigenetics is the field of science. Right. And the point about it in the beginning part, just like everyone else, my idea is, oh, you're a quack, a sham, a fake, a pseudoscientist, blah, blah, blah. And I had to go, hey, I'll just give you the data. It's the data of science and you want to argue about that, but no, they just didn't want to do it because it was too, right. too big a change. I go, we must make this change. Yeah. It's the only way to survive. But when you really get it, it's more than survive because now it's called thriving. You wake up every day with the reality, oh my God, I'm creating this universe. Well, what do you want to create? <laughs> do you want this war, this violence, all these problems, the you know, the pollution, the toxic environment, all that? Or do you want right. something different? <laughs> And the idea is when we own it, we are powerful. Right. When we talk about it, and this is true for me, I start right off and say, this is true for me for what reason? I saw this science back in 1967. 
I saw it, I said, oh my God, I couldn't wait to tell people. I said, if you understand this science, you can create the most fabulous life on this planet. And then they'd look at me and go, you know, Lipton, you, you, your story is great, but your life doesn't match your story. You don't, you don't look that successful up here. You don't look, you know, like uh, your words don't match your life. That was my wake up call. Right. That right. said, oh yes, I'm conscious and quite aware of this new science, but guess what? My life didn't change. I had the exact same life I had before because at that time I didn't realize my life is not coming from my creative conscious mind. Neither is anybody else's 95% of our life is coming from programs in the subconscious. So while I was talking great stories of how wonderful the world and heaven on earth and all this, my life was miserable right? because I wasn't using that mind. I was using my program of limitation and that was the wake up call. I said, oh my God, I can almost hear myself say, uh, do as I say, not as I do. And it's like, oh, that would be stupid to <laughs> say that. Uh, and it became a test point. Yeah. I said, is this real? Then if it's real, then you better darn well look at it in your own life mm -hmm. and see and try it. And that was the, the movement that changed everything for me. Because right. I honestly have to tell you, I love my life. I think it's the greatest thing in the whole world. I celebrate life every day when I wake up. Why? Because I am not a victim of my programming anymore because right. I right. change my program. And when I change my program, that's like taking the red pill, getting rid of the old program and having an opportunity to put in a program you want, not the one you have been programmed with already. Right. And that leads us to a question that a lot of people have when they hear you speak or read your books. You know, I actually had someone write and say, you know, I love his books and the biology belief and all of that, but what do I do now? You know, how do I overcome the program? And so whether it's on, I think there are, there are two ways in which we can look at this question. Uh, one from the personal level, how do we, how, what are the ways in which you suggest, um, you know, and I, I, as a hypnotherapist, I'm like, I want to answer this, but people want to hear your answer <laughs> to um, how, how do you overcome your own personal programs? And then on a collective basis, if we know that, you know, there are these programs running, creating our collective reality, how do, how can we start to create a different political reality, you know, economic, environmental reality, you know, country by country or town by town? So in that two kind of two pronged way in which I'm asking you the question is, now that we know that the programs are running, what do we do about it? Okay. So before you can do anything about it, you actually have to know what the programs are. Mm -hmm. And this becomes problematic because you were being programmed in the last trimester of pregnancy. Even before you were born, you were getting programs because your mother's blood is going into the placenta. It's not just nourishing the cells. That's what we used to think. That's all the mother has to do is provide nourishment because genes are going to control the rest of the programming. So just worry about the nourishment. Okay. Right. But now right. we know epigenetics that there's more than nutrition in blood is information her hormones her emotional chemicals her growth factors all these neuropeptides they're responding that 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 chemistry is a reflection of what's going on in her life and so when a baby is being nourished in the last trimester of pregnancy it's not just getting nourishment it's getting behavioral responses that the mother is experiencing and downloading those even before it's born so an addictive personality can happen even before you were born. And then the next seven years, you're in a, uh, you know, in a state of hypnosis, being a hypnotherapist, uh, where you are downloading, not, not by working at it. All you had to do is open up your eyes. <laughs> Everything was just like recording in like a video camera, recording your experiences. Uh, and so then it'd be, you know, it, it really becomes important to say, so what program did you get when you were zero? <laughs> okay, when you were one. No, I, I don't know that. Two. No, I don't know that. And I said, well, you had a lot of programming. And so I'm going to just make it real quickly then. How do you know what your program is? And then, of course, I stand back and go, because science has revealed that 95% of our life is coming from the program. Then the fact is simple. Your life is a printout of your programs. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what does that mean? I said, well, look at your life and just divide it right away into this. The things you like that come into your life, they come in because you have a program to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. But then the more important one, the things you seek, the things you want, and you have to work hard. You have to put a lot of effort into it. You're going to have to sweat over it. And I say, so why is so much effort going into getting what you want? And the answer inevitably is 
because whatever that destination is, your program doesn't support it. Right, and this right. is why you are working extra hard to override the program. So by all of a sudden, I just said, well, now that you look at your life, I say, whatever you're struggling with is because your program doesn't support that. You're not a victim of nature. Nature doesn't want to give you that. Mm -hmm. That's not true. Your own programming is preventing you from getting that. So now the first thing is mm -hmm. we just said is, well, what are the programs? I say, look at your life. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now you want to change the program. I said, well, the, the program is in the subconscious mind, which is separate from the conscious mind, which then becomes a fact that we should just mention. And that is people say the mind. I go, no, no, there are two minds and each has a different function and each learns in a different way. And that's where the problem comes from. The conscious mind, the latest evolution of the brain related to a lump of tissue right behind your forehead called prefrontal cortex is the seat of your personal identity, your connection to spirituality. The subconscious mind is a database, right. a download hard drive of programs, okay? So conscious mind is creative. When I ask, what do you want out of your life? Your wishes and desires come from the conscious mind, okay? Uh, and then I say, and, and the subconscious, I say, no, have it. It's a program. Push the button. The program will play from now until forever. And everyone say, oh, subconscious, where the evil is. And I go, no, you, you know it's not. <laughs> the, it's just a program. Let me give you a benefit, a benefit of subconscious. When did you learn how to walk? Right. Oh, or two. Did you have to relearn how to walk again? No. And I go, right. that's the benefit of the subconscious. Those things that we need to learn and we don't have to relearn them become habits in the subconscious. Okay. So it's the habit mind. Right. Okay. I say, well, then they have two functions, creativity, conscious, habit, subconscious. Then I go, how does conscious mind learn? Well, being creative in any number of ways, listening to this podcast, uh, reading a self-help book, going to a lecture, even just going, aha, a new idea. I just changed my conscious mind by doing that. Subconscious mind, how does that change? I go, ah, it's the habit mind. The first principle of a habit is you don't want it to change if you create a habit. I learned how to walk. Do you think I want to wake up tomorrow and forget that? Uh, ride a bike, drive a car. No, I learned these. So I don't want to. So first of all, it says it's resistant to change. Mm -hmm. First thing, it's resistant to change because if habits would change all the time, they wouldn't be habits anymore. Right. So you have to recognize since it's resistant to change, then you really have to understand how does a, a, you know, a program get in there. The first seven years, it gets in because the brain is operating at a lower vibrational frequency than consciousness. A child really gets into predominant consciousness, which is called alpha vibration, after seven seven and after okay yeah before seven the primary brain vibration is read by eeg wires on your head you can read the brain it's called theta that's lower than consciousness uh it's imagination and this right. is why kids live in the real world the imaginary world a, a tea party with nothing and drinking nothing and how <laughs> wonderful the tea just was uh it's imagination theta but theta is hypnosis right. so if you want to change the subconscious mind, the primary way was hypnosis. That's how it learned in the first place, okay? After age seven, how did it learn? I go, oh, it learned in a different way. After age seven was repetition. Mm -hmm. Everything you wanted to learn, you practice and you repeated it and you repeated it until you could get it. Once you got it, it's now a download. So yeah. the fundamental ways that the subconscious learns, the two fundamental ways are hypnosis mm -hmm. through theta and repetition or habituation of a practice that you must repeat, like playing an instrument, driving a car, I don't care what it was, you had to practice. And then there's a third way, which is totally exciting. It's called energy psychology. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, what's exciting about it? I said, well, there's a thing called super learning. Uh, one of the things that uh, is characteristic of super learning is a person can learn how to read a book by moving their finger down the page. As fast as they move, just like that, just as I move my finger down a whole page of text I just read. I just read the page. I read the page. I read the page. You can read a whole book in minutes. Mm -hmm. I say, but if you can use that super learning toward changing a subconscious program, then you can change that program in minutes, in minutes. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh my God. It's like, well, necessity is the mother of invention. We have a necessity. We're facing extinction. We damn well have to change our behavior as best we can, as fast as we can. And lo and behold, energy psychology comes in. Yeah. Uh, uh, and this is a, a, a modality on my website. Very simple. Yeah. Bruce Lipton dot com under resources. I have 25 or more 
energy psychology modalities listed that you can read up on which one excites you. Uh, but so those are the three ways that you can control it. There's a fourth way to change the subconscious, but it's no control. And that is a shock. Yeah, a spiritual shock, a physical shock. Uh, you go to the doctor and all of a sudden you just get told you had terminal cancer. Right. There in that moment is an instant to say, I'm going to change my life. Yeah. Uh, but I can't control that. So it's useful information. It can change the program, but it's not useful to change the program. Right. And it can sometimes change in the opposite direction where you might all of a sudden have some post-traumatic uh, stress as opposed to a helpful program. 100% true. And so therefore, really, uh, we have to look at it and we have to recognize we are programmable mm -hmm. <laughs> and that we got programmed to get, off, to get off the ground. Right. But the program to get off the ground was only created by observing other people. And the reason is very simple. A child has to learn how to be a member of a family and a member of a community. Well, there are thousands of rules you have to participate in. You can't just be anybody. And I say, well, yeah. how does a child, how does an infant learn thousands of rules? And the answer is nature created the first seven years as a download. Right. All the child has to do is observe. And as they observe the mother, the father, the siblings in the community, then yeah. those yeah. behaviors are downloaded. But then the problem is this, then the fundamental programs of your subconscious do not come from creative wishes and desires. It came from observing other people. And since their programs are already screwed up anyway, guess what? You downloaded the screwed up programs. And this is propagating from family to generation to generation. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I am a, a conscious of time, and we have another four minutes. I want to be respectful of your time. I don't know if you have a hard stop, like dead at the top of the hour. Um, so just uh, aware of that. Well, we can do a few more minutes. So okay. if we caught in it, let's just do it. Yeah, okay. So, yes, because I, our radio guests will be, we will be dropping them exactly at the hour, but we can we can wrap up in the next, in the next few minutes. Now, um, I did ask for people to send questions and I, you know, I want to honor some of the things that they wanted to ask you. I, I personally could talk to you for four more hours. Um, so, you know, there were, there were three people who mentioned very specific health issues. So I think they're kind of related and they are looking to see what insights, you know, one person wrote, you know, she has chronic pain, tendinitis, bursitis. Another person says, I want to help people with cancer. Another person says, I have Lyme disease and, you know, I have a hard time uh, minding what I eat. And so um, I think what these people are asking is your perspective on how, what are people missing or what do people need to know when it comes to severe chronic health issues? And before you go into this, um, our, for our radio listeners, if you uh, will let you go at two o'clock on the dot, um, but you can listen to the rest of my conversation with Bruce on the podcast, and you can find more about Bruce and all of his wonderful books and resources on uh, his website, which is brucelipton.com. So uh, we will be saying goodbye to you in about a minute or so. So Bruce, what can we say to people or what would you say to people who are either struggling themselves with a chronic significant health issue like cancer or Lyme disease, uh, chronic pain, or trying to help someone with a condition like this? Well, the, the issue is this, is that we have a tendency to uh, deflect that we have any control and then all of this is the body, the genes, the cells went stupid, the environment was stupid and all this kind of stuff. We are so much more powerful than that and, and, and yet we have been programmed, oh, it's not in your control and the moment you believe that, then you gave up the power and then you have to give it to somebody else and this is where the problem comes right. from. So, uh, for example, let's start with pain. Pain is not in the body part where where you think the pain is let's say i got a pain in my arm i go well the pain is actually up in your head right. it's not in your arm and that you can change this pain and as a hypnotherapist you also know you can actually uh reduce pain for people they can have an operation surgery right. with no anesthetic because you can cut off the pain so the first thing is this do i have to be a victim of the pain can i change it and the answer from what we know psychologically is yes i can change all this Right. Uh, but if you keep thinking it's the part and you keep trying to adjust the part, and I go, that's not where the pain is. The pain is here. <laughs> and we have to change it from there. So uh, that becomes important. When it comes to things like cancer, it turns out uh, cancer isn't due to genes. It's due to a lifestyle situation. So right. a very important point just to bring this up is they followed the fate of children who are adopted into families where there's cancer. Just keep and talking. I'm going to push a couple buttons, but keep talking. <laughs> go ahead. 
Okay. So uh, they followed the fate of what happens to kids that are adopted into families where there's cancer running in the family lineage. And it turns out the adopted child will get the same family cancer as all the natural siblings. And yet, what was the point? The adopted child came from totally different genetics. So, you know, attributing cancer to the genetics. No, no. It's lifestyle. And we have to let go because if you focus on that as genetics, then what do you want to do? You want to kill the cells. You say yeah. they're stupid cells. Like, they're not stupid cells. They are following a conscious program. Right. Uh, and if you want to change the cells, you change the program. Placebo, nocebo, that's what it's all based on, okay? Uh, a very important point is this at the same time because you're talking about, well, somebody has an issue, you want to help them. I, I really have to let people know this is a very critical point for the simple reason is this. A person can only help themselves. Yeah. I want to help you. That's my being a good person and, you know, being a good neighbor or whatever the heck it is, benevolent. I want to help you. If you're not ready to be helped, then my efforts are absolutely totally useless. And this is where people have so much problem because they invest so much to help a family member or, or someone they're close to. And they want so hard to help them and they put all this effort in and nothing changes. And the answer is because the person who has the right. issue is the one that's going to change it, not you. Yeah. Uh, so you say other words, it's not relevant if they don't have a belief system right. to support healing. This is where the problem comes from. So all of a sudden, I have to tell you this is that how many disease is connected to genes? Okay, legitimately, less than 1%. Right. That's a number. Less than 1% of disease is connected to genes. And I, then the question is, then where does the disease come from? And the answer is, ah, not from the genes, but from the lifestyle. And this is why it's so important because it says, well, if I have a disease, then I can change it. I go, yeah, but how do you change it? Not changing the cells, right. changing the lifestyle changes yeah. the disease. And can I help people? Only if they're willing to be helped. Right. And therefore, realize this, you could put a lot of your personal effort and your emotions into this, but if they haven't committed to healing, uh, you just use your energy to no avail. It's just wasted in that regard. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, it goes back to to what you were saying towards the beginning that, you know, belief trumps everything. So belief, Absolutely. belief creates biology. It's proven in quantum mechanics. It's proven in stem cells. Um, and so belief trumps food. It trumps our biology. And so that that's what we all have to work on. Yeah, you know, and, and basically then it sort of takes us all the way back to the beginning. Then if who's creating all this and then all of a sudden you say, if you can own and a lot of people, let me just clear this up right away. Yeah. It's really important. Because if I say, oh, well, cancer is a consciousness thing and all this, and people go, oh, I caused my own cancer. I'm to blame. I should have shame. I'm guilty. And I go, this is, let me just straighten this one out because this is clear. It's the most important point. The words blame, shame, guilt, victim, they only are based on this. If you know there's a right way to do something and you knowingly choose to do a different way, right. you're guilty, you are blamed, you should have shame and all that. Right. But if you have no knowledge of how anything worked or incorrect knowledge of how it worked and you followed that and then something happens and you get sick and then you find out, oh my God, consciousness did it, then guess what? You cannot use the words shame, victim, guilt, blame, they're only based on you had pre-knowledge of the right way and with that knowledge chose to do it the wrong way. Right. But if you have no knowledge, then you cannot use those words, guilt, shame, blame, victim, and all that. So why is it important? Well, yes, we are creating our, conscious, con, uh, we're creating our cancer with consciousness. Should I blame you if you have cancer? I go, Nope. Why? You didn't even have any idea that consciousness was involved. So how can you be blamed? Right. So the most important step for the people that are in a problem, uh, you want to, if you want to own the truth, it's hard because if I say, yes, you created your can your cancer. And then you go, Oh no, I can't accept that because then I'd be guilty and all right. that. I go, that will prevent you from making the healing you need. Right. So the first thing is this, you have no idea how it worked. Then by definition, you can't be guilty or a right. victim or shame about this because no one taught you. But now we're learning. And why is it relevant? Because once you learn, now you have to have the, uh, the consciousness to, to work yeah. it. Then you can be the architect of, of the different outcome. Absolutely. So, Bruce, oh my goodness, so much 
so much that you bring to the world um, through who you are, through your science, your brain, your heart, um, the the living example that you are, and how we can all uh, be the architects in our own in our own lives, in our own faith, in our own fates, and in the world. One thing that I want to mention because it gave me a ton of hope and so much inspiration is that towards the end of your book and uh, spontaneous evolution, you talk about things like um, heart uh, heart resonance and heart coherence and how when we start to more consciously be open-hearted and happy and joyful and bring that into the world that we can kind of entrain the rest of the world around us and for those who are looking for hope and inspiration as to what we can do on a political basis, on a collective basis, environmentally, I think there's a lot of hope in your book. And um, I, I don't want to take mo uh, more of your time because I so appreciate you joining me today and joining our audience. Um, but I wanted to to wrap up on, on a thought of hope and inspiration. And I don't know if there are any final words that you want to add to that. Well, for me, I, uh, you know, listen, I, I never believed in the stuff that I'm talking about <laughs> as a conventional scientist. And if I go back and look at my life as a conventional scientist, it was filled with the typical struggles that most people have every day and the and the illnesses and all these things like that. And then I said, I moved into this, not because at first the awareness was like, wow, this is really great. I moved into it from the embarrassment of trying to talk about how great it was. And yet being an example of not being great was like, that didn't fit. Right. And then once right. I applied it, every level of my life has changed. I don't have a doctor. I haven't had a doctor since, uh, I haven't had insurance since 1992. <laughs> uh, uh, and the reality about it is, is I have a consciousness that you can't afford to get sick. And I say, why is it relevant? Because that consciousness will keep me well. It's the same one that flu season is coming. I say, no, I'm not going to get the flu. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and you have to be careful. So then I say, but here's the missing, the missing part. Because your conscious, your conscious creative mind, which is creative, can say, I'm not going to get the flu. I'm not going to get the disease. Then you get the disease. And you go, well, oh, that positive thinking didn't work. And I go, right. That's because 95% of your life is not coming from the conscious mind's positive thinking. It's coming from the programs right. and your right. biology and your life is a printout of those programs. So before you start blaming, oh, positive thinking doesn't work, you also have to recognize, well, I already have a program that's not supporting me in the first place. So yeah. I, I've got to work on my programs. And this is like where your work with hypnotherapy comes so vital into an individual's life. Why? Because... I got those programs mainly through hypnotherapy. Right. And if I use the same technology, I can rewrite the programs. And then the answer is most amazing thing in the world. And I say, why? Conscious mind wishes and desires. So I say, tell me, tell me what you want from your life. And you go, oh, I want to be healthy. I want to be happy. I want to be in love. And I go, okay, this is re really great. Uh, and then I say, yeah, but unfortunately, you're not living from that mind. Right. And if I take the wishes and desires, though, that I have in that conscious mind and using something like hypnotherapy, put those into my subconscious. Th this is now the most fabulous conclusion, and that is this. Once wishes and desires are the programs, guess what? You never even have to think about it because you're not thinking about your programs right now. They're running all the time anyway. Right. So the right. idea is it's like not you have to work and stress your whole life to be on the positive side. I say once the program is in, let go. Yeah, It's automatic yeah. at this point. And, and heaven on earth is automatic when you put in the positive programs and eliminate those that take away your power. I love it. And I am so grateful for you, for your work, um, for all that you do and everything that you share and how, again, you're showing us through your example of what's possible and we're, what we're each meant to do. So thank you again, Bruce. Um, thank you so much for joining me here. It's been I, I am so happy to be here with you and I'm so happy because this is an opportunity to speak to your audience. Uh, because each one of us is, is a voting member of this heaven on earth thing. Yeah. And if we engage our vote, we'll manifest it. And, and, uh, 
and, and some of us know this from our personal life experiences already, but we have to help those that are still lost in the, in the uh, programming that sabotages our wishes and our desires to help them get that stuff up. Let's get out of that old problem. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. Um, that's my mission for sure, to uh, help people discover and be inspired uh, to, to believe that they, can, that they can thrive and that they're meant to thrive, that it's possible. I think it's great. Wonderful. Well, Bruce, you have a wonderful rest of your day, uh, a lovely trip to d down south in New Zealand, and uh, all my best to Margaret as well. I appreciate that so much. And again, thank you so very much for this opportunity. Thank you. This is the Thrive with Morella podcast. You can find all of the resources mentioned in this episode in our show notes at thrivewithmorella.com forward slash podcast. Remember, Morella is spelled with two L's as in more Ella. Do you have a question for me or one of our guests? Join our Facebook community on the Thrive with Morella Facebook page and post your question there. You can also watch the replay of our live interviews and find additional tips, tidbits, and resources for thriving on that page. This podcast is supported by Pure Energy Apothecary, a Vermont body care and aromatherapy line made with 100% clean, plant-based ingredients that everyone can recognize. Their body butters, lotions, soaps, oils, scrubs, and bath salts are heavenly. They're like a mini spa vacation. In today's hectic world, time is a commodity. Every moment to pamper yourself should be an escape for your soul. You can find all of their wonderful products at retailers nationwide and also on their website at pureenergyvt.com. And if you loved our show, the best way to support us is to share with your friends, spread the love, subscribe to the podcast, and leave us a quick review. It really, really helps us get the show out in the world and make sure that other people can find it as well. And did you know that you can also watch and tune in live? On Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, we do all of our interviews live, and we stream them on TV, radio, and Facebook. And you can get the details on our podcast notes page. This program was produced at the Media Factory in Burlington, Vermont. Special thanks to all of the staff for making this come together. And our theme song is Songbird by the talented Ryan Motblue. And a special thanks to you, our listeners, for supporting us and sharing your comments and questions. A thriving world starts with your thriving. Thank you for taking care of you and helping create a better world. I'm Morella DeVoe. Thank you. I hope to see you next time.